What makes a great record producer? Briefly, in one sentence, in one word. Oh, boy. I, I think a lot of it is being a fan of the artist, believing in the artist. Um, I, yeah, I think it's enthusiasm. You know, all the technical stuff enthusiasm. you learn comes later. I, I think you just have to want to get in there and kill for the artist and, yeah. and really make them shine. You know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a 13, 14 year old kid still, you know, opening up that shrink wrap for the first time uh, on a, on an album. And, and, you know, as a fan, you're going like, wow, I hope it's as good as the last one, or maybe it's even better. Or that one song That's I heard really on the right. radio from the new album sounded kind of weird. I don't know what to think. You know, you, you, I think there's part of you that has to be that where you're like, rooting for the artists and protecting them and, and, and just wanting to make them look good. And then you want to go out and tell all your friends about it and how good this record was. And, and, you know, and that translates to you want to reach as many people by what you do in the studio. You know, I always think about that. Like, how can I take Cherry Glazer from being this LA cult favorite to something much bigger that the, the, the audiences are going from, you know, 2000, 200 in a club to 2000 in, in a concert hall. And I, I always think of like, how can I expand it? How can I make it more cinematic? You know, how can I get more in people, more people to have the enthusiasm that I have about this particular artist? Gosh. Perfectly said. Love that. Let's play a little game. In one word, one phrase, one sentence, tell me why these next five producers are great producers. Okay? Okay. Butch Vig. Wow. Uh, everything he does is just classic. Needless to say, Nirvana, Foo Fighters, Pumpkins. Uh, when I heard the Pumpkins... Gish, not, let alone Siamese Dream, Gish alone, I was like, this is turning a corner. This is reinventing something. This is taking what was grunge alternative, which was an indie small audience, a niche, and turning it into something that is global. Same thing I was just talking about, reaching people. Butch had this way, Butch has, still has this way of doing it where he still makes records that are totally honest and true to the artist, but they are so huge. Garbage. We forgot about garbage. Yeah. What else? That's not one word. <laughs> Gosh, I saw Billy Corgan down in Nashville and we were talking about him. That's why he was the first one on the list. But Gish, I have the Smashing Pumpkins tattoo on my heart. I'm from Chicago. That uh, of band course you meant know. so much yes, to me that growing was the, up. The city. Yep. Yeah, and there's two, pe there's two kinds of people. You either get the Smashing Pumpkins or you don't. Oh, uh, interesting. I, I mean, that's how I feel. Oh, anyways. no, I'm from, from that first record on, I'm just like, what? Completely different producer, George Martin. The Beatles. Well, obviously, the fifth Beatle, brilliant arranger, put the extra musicality into that band. Um, and the, the wonderful thing was how he, he himself morphed with them over the times. Like, you know, those records are all different, uh, very different experiences. And somehow he put himself in every one of them in the best way. And having worked with him as an assistant engineer with Jeff Emmerich, wow. I mean, he was the ultimate gentleman. And again, only got involved when he needed to get involved. Would the Beatles be the Beatles without George and Martin? Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Absolutely. To the degree of what they are to in 23 now? Who knows? Yeah. Uh, but I think they would have been huge. I think the times, times were right for it. Um, you know, when you think of the early Beatles, um, the innocence of those songs, the, the, the world was in a place where it, it was ready for the whole British phenomenon to happen. You came up in the 80s and your class that you kind of came up with, with like a Nico Bolas, but in this room, 1977, the band Van Halen comes in. Ted Templeman was the producer. Uh, did you know Ted Templeman much? I never knew Ted or Don. Loved their work. I was a huge fan of 
all those Warner Brothers records yeah. at the time. The stuff that Ted Templeman did, Old Russ George. Teitelman, Lenny Warrenker. Those are all just classic records. And those producers, you know, those all those sort of in-house producers – they all went from genre to genre. One day they're doing Maria Moldar, and the next day they're doing Van Halen, and then they're doing Ry Cooter, or... Yeah. They're uh, it's brilliant. Did you know Lenny Warnerker? Very well. He's amazing. I, I love Lenny. He's... Uh, uh, talk about great A&R men. He's exactly what you want. He has your back all the time he will you will make a better album w if lenny is involved and you know he may say two things in the course of the album but they will make the record better yeah he was very instrumental in gary clark jr's warner brother that was That's one right. of his last things before he stepped down kind of <clears throat> mm -hmm. he's fully retired now right i, I think so I, I think knowing lenny he's probably got his hands in things yeah he's scouting talent doing something but the music from warner brothers for the last five decades is overseen dreamworks, by lenny everything. Warner. yeah, yeah, yeah. dreamworks um let's go a different genre mark ronson Love Mark, even though he beat me out for Producer of the Year Grammy. But um, which one? I was nominated for Producer of the Year uh, the same year that he won for Amy Winehouse. Oh, but wow. of course, may the better man win. He deserved it. That record is timeless. Just the idea of getting the daptones involved, uh, just brilliant. Like. Everything about those records, back in black, it's, it's back to black, I should say. It, it's, it's just great. It's just, just great. But why is he a great producer, Mark Ronson? Wow. Uh, yeah. I think if anybody can create something that is that timeless and that cuts across all genres, cuts across all types of people, um, I mean, and he got you to love her. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, he really brought out performances in her where you just loved her as an artist, as a person, as a storyteller. You felt her. Great stuff. The, down even to the recent couple of years ago, Queens of the Stone Age record he did. That was a really unusual pairing. Wow. But he brought some really unique things to that record. I didn't know he did yeah. Queens of the Stone Age. I think the last album. I'm spacing out on the name of it, sorry. Have you ever been in the studio and you've heard a song being tracked or a vocal go down and it's brought you to tears? Always. Name one song that you've well, produced. Rufus, Rufus Wainwright. You know, I, I was in the studio countless times with, with Rufus and the performances were, yeah, you couldn't help but hold back, uh, but, but fight the tears. I mean, it would just... Incredible. Etta James, same thing. I mean, she was the blues. She had the blues. She, I mean, I, I, my hair is standing up, you know? Incredible. Wow. Elton. Yeah, I was just, I'm, I've been fortunate to be in the room in those moments many times where, like I say, the song just transcends the equipment, the people, everything. It just cuts through it all and reaches you on some base mathematical, emotional level that you can't explain. Beautifully said. I knew the answer to that, but I was just wanting to hear you <laughs> say it. 